our team is over 40 now. So when I first started, just to give you some context, we were nine and now we're over 40 in the last two years. So we've grown really quickly. Uh, so what I do when I coach them is I support them in, in any way I can. I ask a lot of questions. I look for ways to improve our workflows, our policies to make sure that they feel engaged and productive. So in other words, I'm kind of a detective problem solver. <laughs> Cool. So you have been with Betterman for, you, you mentioned, how many years now? It's been two years. I actually just had my two-year anniversary back in June. Oh, yeah. congratulations. So, still, like, yeah. yeah. So, you know, now that, you know, we are going through this, well, we kind of, we are still going through this pandemic, but how has it changed for you in terms of a typical day at the office? I know before COVID, you mentioned that, you know, you would go into the New York office, but how has it, how is it different now? And how do you think it would change? I mean, it's radically different, right? So even though we were able to work remotely before and on some, you know, occasional basis, now it's full time. And so, you know, we went from having an open office space and coming in every morning, you know, getting ready. We have a kitchen. I used to make those like oatmeal blueberries. I used to have like my little ginger tea. I had this routine and, you know, getting everyone to the phones before 9 a.m., making sure everyone's ready to go. That was my sort of morning uh, routine every day. And so now it's very different, right? Now I, I log into my computer, I make sure that everyone's checked in, I make sure everyone's okay, I see how they're doing, and mm -hmm. it takes a lot more over communicating than before. So before, when we were in that open office space, there was a yeah. lot of looking, right? Like, how's everyone doing? Just, you know, and whenever someone was struggling, I'd come over and be like, you know, what's going on? And now it's like, the connectivity is such a main focus, right? How do we stay connected while we are fully just in our own homes, doing our own thing, sort of mm -hmm. tunnel vision, right? So that's, that's my main focus right now. Has it made your, your, your job a little bit more difficult? No, yes. Keeping yeah. morale is you know, pretty important, right? So that, that morale passes on to your customers as they help them too. It has definitely added more challenges to what I already knew was going to be a challenging job. So, you know, I took this job on as a manager or a lead back in, in April, and I was transitioning through March. And we all remember what happened in March. That's when the mm -hmm. market crashed. It's when this pandemic was really hitting us in the U.S. It was when New York was really getting, you know, sort of um, all the news at once. And so... At first, I was like, oh, it's great. I get to work from home, <laughs> right? So yeah. at first, I was like, how nice. I don't have to commute. You know, the, those New York commutes are really, really something. Mm -hmm. So what happened was I, I felt like the challenges were how do I, you know, there's always this balance between micromanaging and undermanaging. And that, that sort of insecurity as a manager is heightened when you're not around the people you're supposed to be overlooking. Mm -hmm. So then it becomes, well, how do I find that balance while I'm in my own room at home, <laughs> right? So it just adds this nuanced layer. And yeah, it is, it is very challenging. But, you know, I think the trick here is to constantly ask yourself the question, you know, are we feeling connected? What ways can we feel more connected? Is this really the most pressing issue right now? Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, working remotely has definitely just added a whole other layer. So how many people do you oversee? And I know you have distributed teams as well, right, for customer yeah. success? Yeah, so we have over 40 people on our CX team. Mm -hmm. They're in different cities as well. So we have Philly, we have Denver, we have New York. We're now looking to see maybe in the future, you know, that could expand more. So we did have some uh, work remote. We, we did have some, you know, best practices for working remotely already, and this sort of ramped it up for us, this whole pandemic. So mm -hmm. I'm now managing nine people at the beginning of my, you know, um, management role, I should say back in April, I was managing about four or five. Mm -hmm. So there's been a lot of reshuffling, a lot of, you know, new responsibilities on top of new challenges. It's been, it's been a lot. Yeah. Has the workload kind of grown for your team? I mean, given, you know, the whole uncertainty during the pandemic, right? I'm sure people are looking at their finances even more closely. Yeah. Right. So this is a really great point that you're making because, you know, a lot of things felt like stopped 
when this pandemic came mm -hmm. into our lives and a lot of things actually just were accelerated so there are you know the good news here if you want to think about silver linings is that there are companies that are hiring right there are companies in the fintech world and in the insure tech world you know are really looking for people to help with the new demand and the new volume and when i say new demand i don't mean it's just more people now right new demand and new volume are two different things new demand is people are looking to companies to secure to feel security in different ways now or feel secure in different ways right so we have new asks now and we have new standards and they're higher mm -hmm. and they're more challenging especially for a startup to meet very quickly right and then the volume was a whole other issue like there's just so many requests how do we answer everyone's question in a day without feeling like we're spent as associates mm -hmm. yeah so i, I want to talk a little bit more about you know management and you know how you kind of rose, you know, to where you are today in the organization. But uh, before we go there, you know, the reason why I wanted you here was because of that essay that you wrote on Alpha. And, you know, like, as I mentioned earlier in, in the session, it kind of, it really resonated with me when I was going through my own path and trying to find um, my way into technology. So you wrote in that essay, um, nobody's career path is linear and predictable, not anymore. Now there is only warmer or colder when navigating through your career and your life. So clearly this statement, you know, very much reflects your own experience and how you got into uh, technology. Can you share more about the journey that you took? Um, and would you, would you call it a journey of soul searching? Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. That, that article is really, really something. I, I didn't think it would, really hit as many um chords or it would resonate with so many people as it did but i'm starting to see that you know a lot of people's journeys not are not linear my journey was definitely not linear i at one point worked at the international rescue committee i was helping people pass their naturalization exams in the u.s then i worked as a miami rep for lyft and i helped bring car sharing ride sharing to miami uh, one of my less glamorous jobs is uh, I worked at the International Film Festival in Miami when I was living there. And, you know, I put it down in my resume and, you know, people asked me what did I do. I said PR and operations, but really that was just a fancy way of saying I escorted directors to the right door, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I worked in sales, I worked in hospitality. I mean, I really did try everything, right? And so I would describe my path, my career path as a game of hopscotch. I don't know if you guys remember that. Is that like too old? No. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the whole thing. So it's that's how I would describe it. You know, I went to grad school because I thought that's what I needed to do, and it just you know that's that's what everyone was doing, and it's what people were telling me to do. And for a long time, I was grasping at straws, and it wasn't until I think everyone sort of had that has that aha moment, you know. And mine was getting this this opportunity to potentially work at TED if you guys know TED Talks, you know, so I was interviewing with them and I was, I got to the last round and I was so hurt when I didn't get the job. And I think that's when I sort of said, okay, enough, enough with this aimless ambition. You know, I really need to start thinking about what it is I want, right? Because clearly what I've been doing is not matching sort of the, the jobs that I'm, ex that I'm seeking or I'm excited about. So, I used to really compare myself to friends and where they were in their careers and get really depressed about that. And that's when I just thought, okay, like enough about, you know, comparing myself enough with trying to do what people expect me or want me to do, right? It was about what I needed to do. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, in, you know, in the conversation that we had earlier, um, you brought up a couple of strategies, um, you know, to find this career fit, right? Could you share a little bit or maybe like one or two pointers that you that were particularly helpful for you to identify this career fit for yourself yeah so i you know looking back i i wasn't this organized but you know if i were to say like how to do it i would say you know ask yourself what excites me right and and and, and what is it that i would do if there was just no chance of failing just keep keep the, the net wide, right? If you wanna if you wanna be you know part of a circus troupe and you wanna go into hot air balloons and you love swimming with dolphins and that's important to you, like make that your thing, you know. Just be unashamed, own it, write it down, see where that can take you, right? Uh, so 
beyond just asking yourself, you know, what excites me and what interests me, think of also the companies that excite you and interest you, right? So, so what is, why is, is a dream job for me at Google? Like, okay, what does Google offer? You know, is it truly a place that I actually want to be in? Is it the benefits, is it the responsibilities? Are those things recreatable somewhere else, right? So that's the first thing. Just ask yourself a ton of questions. Uh, and then do the research. Find the specific job description with a specific title that you want. I think a lot of us think about casting a really wide net from the beginning. And while that's something that you do want to do, as I mentioned before, cast a really wide net, when it comes to actually executing on what your mission is, you need a really, really, really narrow mission. You need to know exactly what job it is you're looking to get and just go after that one job. Don't apply to 15 or 20 or 30 thinking that, mm -hmm. you know, it would just get you better results. Mm -hmm. So you, you also mentioned that, um, I think in our earlier conversation, you talked about how you matched kind of, or you identified the skills that, you know, you, you know, you used throughout all the different jobs that you were work you, you you had right and using that to identify your talent or the skills that you were stronger in to apply for the next job can you kind of um, touch on that a little bit yeah so i knew that there were just things i was good at and i was having a hard time pinpointing so I was doing, I was doing something interesting. I was, I was looking at jobs and seeing how I fit those jobs. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I did it the other way. I thought, okay, let me just see what I'm really good at and see what fits me. Right. Like what companies actually would do really well with my strengths, my values, my competencies, what I value, what I care about. So, you know, I wrote down a list of all the things that uh, I was really good at and how I did that was I went through, you know, my, my job experience, you know, what was it about Kamita that I loved? What was it about the IRC that I loved? What was it about those things that I hated? Right. So I knew I was really good with people. Okay. I'm really, I like helping people. How, okay. What does that mean? So my strength is that I'm empathetic. Right. Um, so why do, why, why is empathy just, you know, why, why am I good at that? I've, I've just had a lot of experience and training, right? It's something that excites me. I like knowing what people, you know, are thinking and what, what, you know, drives them and motivates them. So, you know, you can't do this alone. I have to say, I have to stress that this is something you do with a friend that you trust, with a mentor that has the experience that you also, you know, admire, right? So these are conversations to be had with people, not just yourself. Mm -hmm. So did you, how long did it take you for, you know, to identify all the strengths and skill sets that you had, you know, yeah, and so embark on this soul searching and this whole career fit experience? So I graduated in May of 2017. Yes. So I was looking and I, and I had a job at, at Kamita. One of my friends had this really great startup and it was like gastro diplomacy. I thought it was really interesting. Uh, it goes back to me wanting to be in a place that has a strong social impact. So, you know, again, aimless ambition for a while, right? It's, I really want to do, I, I'm really good at things. I just don't know. Like, what I'm supposed to be doing. And then, you know, through friends, you know, through people that I really admire and support, they were like, you should look at LinkedIn. LinkedIn is a really great resource. And here's what you should do. And everyone gave me their own, you know, uh, advice. And mm -hmm. I went into LinkedIn probably February of 2018. And I did a few things. And I just started getting people sending me emails. And those things that I did was, you know, go into my profile, boost my, my uh, bio. So like I would, um, when I say boost my bio, I would go into my bio, make it better, right? I'd make it more impactful, concise, clear to the point, authentic. I did the same for my headline. I changed my picture. That really matters too. Um, mm. I did all these things. I, I changed my experience to, to showcase the strength that I wanted people to really see. Uh, when it came to recruiters looking for people for specific jobs. So, and then, you know, like, so it seemed like LinkedIn played a really critical part of your, you know, job hunt and yeah. helping you on this soul searching, um, right, is for a career fit and so on. So I think, you know, we talked about trying to understand what the audience, you know, and how the audience, our audience today would approach, you know, um, 
the job hunt, right? Like what kind of channels, you know, they would use. So maybe what we could do is let's run a really quick poll just to see what people are using in their job hunt. And then, you know, I want you to share how you leverage LinkedIn specifically as you talked a little bit about that. So, um, you know, if you're in the audience, you would see a little poll that comes up, um, giving you guys a couple of seconds to kind of um, put in your answers. And then, so Belle can share a little bit more. She gave me a lot of tips and great tips about how to use LinkedIn. So let's see how everyone, um, how everyone's getting jobs and you know, how you can leverage LinkedIn for. I'm not gonna vote. I don't wanna, I don't wanna skew the vote. <laughs> <laughs> let's see. So Belle, can you see it on your end? Can you see the poll on your end? Yeah, I can, yeah. Okay, so we have a lot of people say they apply online. Oh, I can't um, see the results. Oh, you can see the results? Yeah. Okay, we will share it with you soon. So, okay, let's share the results. Can you see it now? Yes, okay. So 45% said I applied online. That is the majority, followed by I pursued the company hiring manager executive. Okay. And then after that, it is a friend acquaintance. And lastly, I got contacted by the recruiter. So that's interesting, right? So mm -hmm. I spent a few weeks on my profile here and there, and I got contacted by many recruiters. And that is the best position to be in. I mean, I don't have to tell you, right? It, it feels wonderful when someone seeks you out and says, I think you'd be a great fit. I think that is something that people don't do because we're taught that we have to apply online and we have to like earn it and we have to deserve it and we have to do X, Y, Z and we have to fit a certain mold. I'm here to tell you there is a company out there that knows your value, thinks you're brilliant and wants you on their team. It's the truth. So maybe we could go into a little bit more, you know, you talked about headline and you talk about, you know, changing your profile, even your profile, was it even your profile picture? I, I wasn't sure if that was part yeah. of it, but you kind of use your soul searching um, journey, right? And figure out all your skill sets and what you liked and what you were strong in and kind of incorporating that into your LinkedIn profile. Am yeah. I right? Yeah, that is correct. So I had to do part of the work, which is the research, right? So the research is on you. What is it that motivates you? What excites you? What are your strengths? The second part is getting someone, like I said before, who you feel like is a good su uh, support or mentor or coachy. They also are on LinkedIn, right? So if you go, there's a lot of free content around how to boost your profile through changing your picture. What is it about your picture that makes you more interesting or more hireable, right? What is it about your headline? There's some really great tips. So like you said, I did change my picture. I changed my headline. I changed my bio. Now, the other thing that I did that I think was really instrumental was that I looked for the keywords mm -hmm. that job descriptions would post, right? And there are some really great tools. I believe there's one called cloud cloud words cloud so there's some really great websites that when you input text into they'll show you this like really cool visualization of what keywords really pop up the most right so for take LinkedIn. those sorry for linkedin specifically so any there's there are sites that allow you to put any text from anywhere and they'll show you the most used words or the words that come up the most yeah oh okay across the web yeah not linkedin specifically right yeah, yeah, you just put whatever text from, so you can just grab a job description and, you know, instead of going through it yourself, you can mm -hmm. just put it through this machine, it'll bring you out, it'll bring up all these really great keywords, and those are the words that you want to put into your profile, right? Now, mm -hmm. some people will say, well, that's cheating, and, you know, you're molding yourself, but the truth is, you know, a lot of this is automated. LinkedIn is automated. Everything about LinkedIn is an algorithm, right? So mm -hmm. how recruiters find you is also luck. Right? And you can help yourself by making sure that you have all these boxes checked, right? So making sure that you have the keywords that will really, you know, uh, make you a, a competitive candidate. And who's to say you don't have those strengths? Just because you wouldn't choose the word yourself does not mean you, you know, wouldn't have that skill set anyway. So uh, that's something that I would really recommend. Um, something else is you can look to see who, not only who views your profile on LinkedIn, but there's a section that allows you to see how recruiters or who, or how you popped up. So what keywords 
were mm -hmm. used for your profile to pop up. I would go in there, you know, periodically every, every week or so, and I would see UX designer. You were found with this search item or this keyword. And I thought, oh, that's not right. So I'd go back into my profile and I would, I would change some things. So the beauty about LinkedIn as well is you can update your resume 500 times a week, right? And no mm -hmm. one is going to call you out on it, right? So trial and error is your, your, also your friend. So uh, seeing what kind of results, seeing who's reaching out to you, what recruiters, uh, what kind of jobs, right? That'll be an indication for you to how to, how to proceed. Mm -hmm. So did you get your job at Betterment through LinkedIn? Yeah. You I want did. to share a little bit about that or how, how you came about that? Yeah. So, you know, as, as I was saying before, I, I started really uh, zeroing on LinkedIn in February of 2018 and I got my job at Betterment. Um, I was actually in the office May 2018. So it took a few months and mm -hmm. only because honestly, you know, the, the interviews took place much earlier, but there was just some time to get into the office. So really I got this job in a few weeks, right? And all I really did was I went into my profile, I consistently changed it, I updated it, I, I refined it, you know, based on the kind of feedback I was getting. I had recruiters from Girl Scouts of America contact me. I had recruiters mm -hmm. from insurance tech companies contacting me. And to tell you the truth, these were companies that I didn't necessarily think to even consider in my job search. But what happened was even better, was that I basically said, here's what I can offer and here's what's important to me. Social impact is huge, right? Working in an ambiguous tech environment where I have a huge say in the process, I want that, right? And there were companies that saw that and said, that's us, we'll give you that, right? And if it wasn't for this journey, you know, who knows what I'd be doing, still aimless, hopefully <laughs> not. Uh, I wouldn't have found something so right for me, right? Like there's something to be said about not putting myself in this box where like, I say, you know, I have to work at Google, I have to work for the State Department, or I have to do these prestigious things. It's like, okay, well, I wanna work for a company that values flexibility, work from home, health insurance, um, collaborative environment, right? And that company will just show up at your door when you're authentic and you put it out there like that. Mm -hmm. So how did you know that Betterment was a company that you wanted to join? So, you know, I took a, I got a, a note from a recruiter on LinkedIn and I thought this is too good to be true. I looked at their website and I was like, I don't know, like it has all the things that I want in a company. Like, how does that happen? And I was reading Glassdoor, the testimonials were also glowing, and I thought, okay, this place wants to create a, so a positive social impact. That's my jam, that's my thing. Okay, the next step now is going to these interviews and interviewing them, right? So I, I felt like when I was going into these interviews after being contacted by a recruiter, that we were on even, even playing field. We're feeling each other out. They, they like, you know, my, my profile, what I could, potentially contribute. I also like what they could potentially do for me, right? So it's, it's one of those situations where I never felt before. I went to an interview feeling like this is very much transactional and there's an equilibrium. So, you know, everyone was really genuine. Everyone was really interested in my story. And for me, they checked all the boxes, you know? Um, and I guess, you know, for them, I mean, I don't guess, I know I checked all the boxes for them. So it became yeah. this, this experience that was really authentic. Mm -hmm. Great. So did you think that any of your previous experiences or skill sets that you developed before Betterman helped you to get this job? Yes. You know, some of it is luck, obviously. Part of it is tech is a really great place because for me, because it, it, it doesn't discriminate, right? Like you could have literally done whatever thing, but if you have X, Y, Z skill set, they will mm -hmm. consider you, right? So that's something else to think about in your job search. You know, what, what, are my, what, what are the limitations of, you know, what I have to offer versus like where I wanna be, right? So, I mean, to put that more simply, I don't think I would have gotten a job at, you know, New York City government right? With the kind of skill sets I had, mm -hmm. but that's okay. I was really looking for 
a place that would accept me for me, right? So that was also something that was really important for me. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you didn't, obviously, you didn't come from a technical background, right? And you just mentioned that, you just said that, you know, tech, technology is forgiving in a way where it's pretty open, you know? So what kind of tips would you give to women who are looking for tech adjacent roles, like, you know, like what you're doing or who are trying to pivot into technology? Where do they start? What do they do? It's a really good question. And to tell you the truth, you know, it, it, I think it's easy for me to say a few words and then what I did um, to, to get here. But I think for everyone, you know, resilience is going to look different. Adaptability is going to look different. But I think what led me here, right, was adaptability. I think my father used to tell me a lot, you know, he's an economist. And so he'd always say, there's no such thing as a bad job. Right. Yeah. So he drilled that into me when I was very young and, you know, when, even when I was struggling to find a job or when I was unsure, it really humbled me. You know, I, I took jobs at restaurants. I took jobs at events. I, I took jobs that like, you know, just were whatever, you know, um, but I, I'm proud of that because I never let a job define me. I never let a job duty define my, you know, identity. Um, I needed to learn what I needed to learn painfully. Right. So yeah. What do I like about this job? What do I not like about this job? So that was really, that was something that, that helped me, right? Being adaptable. Mm -hmm. So that, so basically I think you're maybe kind of taking a step back is to see kind of the skill sets that you have and trying to see how that would fit into a company that, you know, or layering, a, uh, layering technology on top of it for a company to make it a role that you want, right? So, it, yeah, so I think to just be a little bit more clear on what adaptability even means, is like this, this willingness to be uncomfortable. So there's something about tech where things are incredibly amb ambiguous and you have to define everything for yourself along the way. And sometimes if you're a manager, that also means defining things for your team along the way. So it's trying new things that no one else has thought of. It's asking the question, the hard questions, right? How am I doing as a manager? What do you need, right? And then being willing to listen and deliver. So being uncomfortable means you're growing and that's sort of the price you pay, right? Like that's sort of the sacrifice that you make for the success that, that will inevitably come. So would you say that, you know, adaptability is probably the skill or attribute that has been most valuable in your career so far? I might be a masochist, <laughs> so to tell you the truth, it's the one that has served me. It's been painful. I don't know if that's what, what you know, what for everybody. It's probably not for everybody. Um, adaptability, I think, can mean a lot of different things for people, right? Um, mm -hmm. For me, that's what it meant. It meant really pushing myself when things felt hard and, and um, unclear right um and making mistakes along the way like because of that sort of when when you're adaptable or you're someone who strives to be adaptable uh you sort of have to have or learn to have this like high you know risk tolerance and tolerance for failure and maybe that's what i'm alluding to when i say it's hard and difficult because as someone who's really hard you know i'm really hard on myself uh there are times where i have failed you know i have put in a new process that didn't go well or as planned um, or created this thing that you know no one really cared about and so it's a, you sort of learn that that's okay because that's part of how you get better right this didn't work okay next time i'm going to do that instead okay so i think it's a really good segue into you know your current position as you know the customer success team lead at betterman because when you join Betterman, you, were, you join them at an entry level, right? So like an associate or something, and you work your way up to become a team leader. What, in two years, right? Uh, uh, I mean, since you've been there, yeah. What's your secret? How did you get all the way up there? Um, that's a really good question. What's my secret? Well, <laughs> the beauty of tech is that the rules of the game uh, change constantly. So it goes back to adaptability. You know, uh, opportunities open up, uh, there are gaps to fill. You just have to push really, really, really hard to get your voice heard. You have to, you know, make mistakes. 
And I say have to because I almost want to give permission to make mistakes, right? So just know that that is part of the, like the, the recipe or the secret sauce, right? Um, I think it's true of any woman who wants to succeed. This fear of failure is very real and ingrained in all of us. Um, we have this thing, you know, at work uh, called Donut Be Strangers, okay? And it's a program where we get paired with uh, random people at Betterment. And Betterment will pay for your coffee and give you $5 each to go and oh. just talk and get to know each other. And I have to say that that was really a huge part of my success, right? It's, I think it's part of it. I don't think it's the only reason, but I think that there's something to be said about, you know, observing a lot, asking a lot of questions, um, figuring out what the culture is about, talking to people who've been here, you know, for four years, five years, two months, right? Um, I think there's, there's a lot to be said there was something interesting that you shared um, in our earlier conversation about the yeah. stickers and the sticker project that you implemented. Do you yes. want to share a little bit about that? And I'm, I'm going to show the audience what she's talking about through a screen share. Um, but you can talk to it, um, you know, as we are looking at it. Yeah, so that's, that's something that, you know, um, you was uncomfortable. Yeah, that was something that was uncomfortable for me because it was really different and it was really just like me showing up. I had just been there for like three months and I said, I have this idea, let's do it. You know? <laughs> and I was really lucky I had a manager at the time who really fostered that. So uh, essentially our X stickers is, is a really important initiative or, or I should say project uh, that allows for, for, for engagement. So our associates, work really hard. The learning curve on, at this job is really steep. And I thought it was really important that we recognize everyone's milestones. So three months in, you know, six months in, nine months in, you would get the sticker. People at work are really obsessed with stickers and that just felt like the natural thing to do. And so uh, we, we take a moment to celebrate people when they hit those milestones and we give them these big X's and people love them. And honestly, this was one of the projects that I felt, you know, really vulnerable about. It was this idea that I had and would people accept it and love it. And to tell you the truth, I know it's a success because I don't even think at this point people know that it's me that made it, right? It's so ingrained in our process and system now that, you know, it's taken a life of its own. People are super excited about it. Um, it's really, been just a really incredible project. So like does each um, colors, you know, kind of X sticker um, tell you at a glance, like which level they are kind of, you know, black belt or yellow belt or something like that? Yeah, that's a great question. So the colors actually don't really mean anything. Those are just fun. So we went from colors to now having like themes. We had like, you know, our Philly office really loves gritty, you know, the mascot, you know, for the, the team. So. We had a little gritty one, we have a little Colorado one because we have a Colorado office now. So really it's the amount of stickers that you have does it denotes oh. seniority. Yeah, so if you have like four or five, six, that means like you've been there for like over a year now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool, okay. So we have a couple of questions um, that I want to get to from the audience. Um, given the time, just one second. Let me scroll my screen share. So let's see. Um, Kayla, she's asking, hey, Sir Bell, she's like, number one, your hair looks amazing. <laughs> and she's asking, do you have any books or podcast recommendations that, you know, have impacted your day to day? Yeah, that's a great question. So I, when I used to commute in New York, I used to listen to podcasts religiously. And I really loved um, Adam Grant's Work Life podcast. That's a really good one. And to tell you the truth, any podcast that's even just not work related would inspire creativity. So I would really recommend that you just keep listening to the podcast that you already listen to. You'd be surprised how much information you'll get from just listening to, to things that really inspire you outside of the office. Uh, but that's a really good one, Work Life by Adam Grant. Everything he, he does is really great. He also has a really great book called Give and Take which is really inspiring because it talks about people like me, people who are maybe seen as too generous at work, right? Givers, 
at work and in, in life, um, he actually has a really great empirical, he, he does his empirical research and he shows you why givers actually are really successful people. Um, fingers crossed that's me, but you know, it's, 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 it's really, it's really, Adam Grant's really great. Mm -hmm. Great. So I hope we answered your question, Kayla. Another attendee wrote, um, what would you recommend to do if you don't already have a mentor? Where might you consider starting to search for one to help you look at your strengths and then look for jobs that match? It's a really good question. So I recommend a, a board of mentors, right? So kind of like a board of directors for a company. You as a person should have a board of mentor, mentors, you know, people from different walks of life. So not just, you know, a really good friend, but someone, you know, like maybe even your, your, your father, someone that you really admire on LinkedIn, messaging them, right? So the question then becomes, how do you find that person? You might have them in your life already. So first I would do an inventory of who it is you already go to for advice. Who is it that you trust? Who is it that has a certain amount of experience that you feel like, you know, could relate to, to what you're going through? Uh, the second thing is, uh, you know, I do love LinkedIn. I really do think that it's a very concentrated place where there are a lot of mentors and coaches that you can find. Uh, I've also, you know, used it as a platform to be a coach and, and to be sort of a guide as well. Uh, it's, it's really just a limitless resource and a really, like I said, a concise one at the same time. So if you just go to LinkedIn and you type in, you know, career coach or I want to find a job in tech, you know, you'll get a, a great result, a lot of results. What's yeah. your take on like cold calling or like, you know, reaching out to someone that you don't know, but he's, he or she's basically in a role that you want to be in? So it's really interesting. You'll have a lot of people give you different advice about when you're on LinkedIn, you should email or message the person at a company that has the same level as you. Some people say you should go two notches up to the one that you want, you know, the, the, the role that you eventually want, right? So my advice is looking at someone's profile, you'll see a lot, right? Especially someone who's very active on LinkedIn, you'll see a lot of uh, their history and where they went to school. I mean, just striking up a connection with them, a genuine one, like, hey, I saw that you wrote this thing. You know, you can even just relate it to a sentence. This really spoke to me, you know, I'd love to connect, right? Without asking for anything. And, you know, I think people are very quick to say, hey, I have this job at your company, See, I saw it open up, like, uh, I, have this, I have this job in mind, can you refer me? And I think that's where people start feeling like, oh, okay, well, I don't want to answer that, <laughs> right? Yeah, just they feel used, right? You know, it was not an authentic connection. Exactly, um, authentic connections, yeah. So I think another question that came in from attendee, what is the best way to make yourself a competitive candidate when you are making a career pivot in a saturated market? That's a great question. You, you want to ask yourself, you know, what value do I add? And that is where the mentors and the friends come in. You ask your friends, you know, and, and at first you'll ask your friends like, hey, what makes me a really good friend? And they'll be like, oh, you're funny, you're smart, you're cool, right? Very generic terms, right? But you have to just keep pushing them. Like, okay, what about me is cool? Okay, that, right? So what else about me is cool, right? Just keep digging and, and, and be, you know, uh, really vulnerable with this person, right? I think, that is going to get you some really interesting results so that when you do go into an interview or you do switch up your resume, you're going to say some things that might actually sound a little crazy to you. Like, what's a, what's a good example of that? You know, um, and when I say crazy, I mean, sometimes we just don't have the self-confidence to say, you know what, I'm a really good communicator. You know what, I can write emails really well. Right. And like in your mind, you're like, well, that's, I don't know, that's weird. Right. <laughs> but there are companies that will read that in your resume and be like, wow, this person writes emails really well. Okay. Let's see what they can actually do. Let's call them in for an interview. And then when you get into an interview, you just like, you just repeat the things that you've heard from your friends, repeat the things that like, you know, make you special. Right. Mm -hmm. I think this ties in really well to a question from Jess. I think she's asking, you know, there are two parts to her question, but I'll go to the second part first because it's in line with what you said. She said, she's asking, did you ever face adversity or self-doubt because of, you know, someone's actions or energy towards you because you're a woman? You know, it could be 
I don't know, we, we don't, we are, we are too empathetic, we are too, yeah, or like so, stereotypes about women, right? Absolutely. I have definitely been told many times that mm -hmm. I am very sensitive, that I'm, that I care too much, that I am uh, looking to coddle people, right? And it's funny because when you're in a business setting and you bring up business problems, morale and people's happiness being one, people will tell you, well, you know, you're just, you're just too involved emotionally, right? And I know our male counterparts don't get that. So here's a funny story, um, to, not, to just be very brief. Our team is mostly comprised of women who are on the phone and over email, right? And they speak to customers. And a lot of times, you know, the few men that are on our team have seen firsthand how a woman will answer a question a certain way, be told that they, you know, that they're wrong and a manager needs to be included. We pass the phone to a male, the male says the same thing and that's case closed, right? We've, and, and we've seen it, we're a very empathetic group. So yes, as a woman, you will definitely, you know, get people telling you that you are too much of this or not enough of that, right? And the self-doubt happens a lot with me. I am constantly thinking about what ways I'm being perceived in what ways I'm being perceived. And, you know, it took me a really long time to understand this, but self-doubt is not inherently a negative thing. Self-doubt is a really great coping mechanism. It really allows you to de decipher, okay, what is it that I'm doing that's actually problematic? And the answer, a lot of times, is nothing, right? <laughs> so, you know, for, for, for those of us that are very self-aware, let's be honest, right? So sometimes it is something, but for the most part, it's like, other people are, you know, perceiving you a certain way, and that's based on their bias, their, you know, inherent whatever, morals, values, and they're just projecting. So is this how you cope with it? Is that how you cope with self-doubt or? Yeah, so the way I cope with it is I ask myself in this in this case, like, what is it that I'm doubting about myself? Right? So I think self-doubt is a bigger umbrella. There are other things within self-doubt that we we can get to, which is is this about self-trust? Do you not trust yourself? Is this about self-acceptance? Do you not accept yourself? Is this about, you know, self-esteem? Do you not believe in yourself, right? So where is that, what is that self-doubt actually about, you know? So I know my, my problem is, or something that I, you know, uh, I'm fo focusing on right now is self-trust. Sometimes I say something and I'm not feeling so great about it. And then one person tells me, you know, that, that was kind of, you, you said something and it was weird and I just crumble, right? And then I have to remind myself, okay, I have to learn to trust myself, right? That's, that's the core of, of, of what my doubt, my, where my doubt's coming from. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, Jess, I hope she answered that part of your question. Um, Jess is asking, her first part of the question is, do you think it's essential to learn how to code or be a programmer? in order to work in tech? No, no, absolutely not. I don't think you have to be someone who has an engineering degree or, you know, analyzes data or Excel or any of those things to thrive and be an excellent leader in tech. And I will tell you why. Emotional intelligence is a rare thing. It is something that you hear about a lot in podcasts, in books, online, in conversations. But when you actually go into these companies, the way that it is applied is actually very surprising, right? It is, it's not as, uh, it's just not as apparent as you would think, right? It's not, it's not as, it's not as obvious, right? That everyone should be operating from this emotional place. So there are, like tech needs people that are on the emotional side of things, on the emotional spectrum. I mean, we, we say soft skills and hard skills, but really like, I like to think of it as just like emotional intelligence, right? It's, it's, it's so necessary in tech. And there are a lot of roles that are not, you know, programming roles. There's marketing, there's sales, there's mm -hmm. research. So there's really a lot of things that you can look into. Project management, right? Tech, you know, programming is just, programming is just one part of yeah. 
the creation of a product, right? There are just so many facets around it that makes it better. So um, there was one other question that came in from Dana. So Dana is asking, how important do you think college degrees are in obtaining your dream job? It's a really good question. So as someone who's paid <laughs> for grad school, <laughs> I can tell you the benefits that I uh, really got from that, which is it's a network. So you're paying, it's a very you know, expensive price tag for a network of people. Uh, and as we all know, networking is horrible. So <laughs> there's something about like going to school and just like, you know, forming relationships that makes it maybe a little bit less like networking and more like, you know, getting to know your classmates and your peers. So the question being, how important do you think a college degree is obtaining your dream job? I don't think it's important anymore. I don't think that tech companies anyway are really looking for people who have you know degrees from harvard yale or anything like that if anything they're looking for people who are just adaptable and you know do the do the work um not in a controlled environment you know it's very easy to get i mean i don't want to say easy but you know you, you can say you went to harvard and you got all a's but what does that actually say about you it says that you're really good at following rules so it's really good at regurgitating information right and not to belittle anyone that's been to an ivy league but it, it does not necessarily set you up for success in tech and i think there are a lot of ways to learn you know like taking programming for example or you know digital marketing or you know even project management right you don't need necessarily have to go to college to learn those skills yeah there are many ways to do it you know um to learn on your own so yeah i don't Going to college is a great experience, but I, you know, like what you said, I don't think it's completely necessary to get into yeah. technology. So, okay. I think in the interest of time, we, I wanted to ask you one final question. Uh, give us one word that you would like to leave the audience with today and why. One word. 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 It's a tough one. I didn't get to prepare, can you tell? Okay, so one, <laughs> word, one word to leave you guys. Yeah. I would say, I've said this a lot today, so I think it's, it's a good one to land on, authenticity. Mm -hmm. Just be, uh, being authentic. Being Finding yourself. Out, yeah, be yourself. And you know, that is such a you know, cliche thing to say, like what does it mean to be myself? And I've been myself and it just got me nowhere, right? People will respond really well when you're authentic, when you're just telling your story and sharing your experience. Um, and then, you know, getting to, to a place of authenticity is hard to do. So you might think that you've been authentic, but there's still, so, there's still work to do. Mm -hmm. You're always searching for who you really are, I guess. You know? Yeah, you know, there's, um, there's no such thing as fully self-actualizing, so in some ways life is really interesting in that there's always more to do and bigger and better things to get to and then it's also exhausting to think about but you know there's a, there's always there's always a way to sort of shift your thinking mm -hmm. so yeah i mean thank you sir bell for speaking with us today i know you mentioned that you you know so attendees um if you have registered for this workshop great there is a checklist and a worksheet that Cerebel has prepared and we will send it to you. So Cerebel, maybe just really quickly, could you tell us what this worksheet is for and how people can best use it for themselves? Yeah, so there's a worksheet that basically helps you start your, your soul searching journey. It organizes your thoughts in such a way and then brings them into a more concise uh, list of basically what you want to prioritize in your life. And then there's a checklist just going over what you should pay attention to on your LinkedIn. Great. And also, Sir Bell, I know you said that you, you know, offer some co career coaching um, as well. So any, uh, I think we will include kind of your contact details in the, the email out to all the attendees. So keep a look out for that and feel free to reach out to Sir Bell if you guys have more questions or you kind of want her thoughts on, you know, um, your own soul searching and you know towards the career path that you want so again thank you so much for your time today we wish you all the best in whatever you do sir Bell, you're amazing and um, you. you know we look forward to seeing all the great stuff you're going to do at betterment as well thank you so much alan this was such yep. a pleasure
Yeah, thank you. So for attendees again, uh, the session has been recorded and we will share it with you via email together with all the links um, and the checklist from Surbel. So keep a lookout in your inboxes. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thanks, Surbel. Bye.